You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Phillips Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Welcome once again to a Bible answer. My name is Mike McDaniel, and I'm the evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. And we're so happy that you have tuned in a Bible answer today, and we hope that you'll tell other people about this program. We have three gospel preachers with us. They'll serve as panelists to answer your Bible questions. We'll have them introduce themselves to you at this time. My name is Andy Brewer. I preach for the Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee. Hello, I'm Jeff Scott, and I work and worship with the Middleton Church of Christ in Middleton, Tennessee. Hello, I'm Joe Rhodes, and I'm the minister at the New Johnsonville Church of Christ in New Johnsonville, Tennessee. We're grateful to these brethren for their time and effort in preparing and studying to answer these questions today. Let's get right to them. Our first question to Brother Joe Rhodes. Brother Rhodes, do Christians become angels after death? Brother Rhodes. I believe the verse in question is Matthew chapter 22 and verse 30 where it reads, From the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. What we fail to see in that verse is the fact that angels are immortal beings. But this verse in particular does not mean that upon our earthly demise that we become angels. The Bible does not indicate that anyone has become or will become an angel after their death. It's true that we will have a new spiritual body, an immortal body, that God will provide for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in verses 50 through 57 tell us that our bodies will be changed as we meet God in the air. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 42, going through verse 44, it reads as this. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, and it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness and raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. But still yet, this does not mean that upon death that Christians become angels. Notice that the Hebrew writer writes in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 and 23, when he says, But you are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men, made perfect." The Bible goes on to state that all things, including angels, were created by God. Paul writes to the church in Colossae in Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things and in him all things consist. Back in Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 6, uh, we read, Thou, even thou, art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein. And thou preservest them all, and the host of heaven worship thee. In Job chapter 38, verses 4 through 7, we're told that at the laying of the foundations of the earth, the shouts of the angels were heard. Since they are spiritual beings, the concept that they have a physical existence or that we will become like them or an angel upon our death is just not a biblical doctrine. Mankind, in its own way, wishes to soften the blow of leaving this earth for the eternal by saying we will become angels but that's not Bible doctrine. The word itself, angel, literally means messenger. And God's word is chocked full of descriptions concerning angels. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 1, 13 and 14, God's word describes them as ministering spirits. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7, Paul tells us that they will come with Jesus in his second coming. 
Acts chapter 12, verses 6 through 10, tells us they were active in filling God's desire. We know that the angel Gabriel met with Zechariah, telling of the birth of John the Baptist, as Gabriel also met with the mother Mary, the mother of Jesus. Go back to Matthew chapter 12 and verse, I'm sorry, Matthew 22 and verse 30. But are as the angels of God in heaven. We say nowhere in the scriptures do we find that we actually become an angel upon death. But the scriptures do tell us that upon our death, that we will be given an immortal body, one sown in corruption, raised in incorruption, one that has God provided. No, we will not be angels, but we will be immortal, a prepared people for a prepared place in heaven, a spiritual body. Therefore, we will be with God in heaven, not in these mortal bodies in which we inhabit now that inhabits the eternal soul made in the image of God, but in an immortal body made for us, prepared for us by God. We will not be angels, but we will be immortal. Thank you for that good question. Thank you very much, Brother Rhodes. To Brother Brewer, should women cover their heads more than with their hair in public worship? Brother Brewer. I want to point out from the outset that culture does not dictate morality. And what I mean by that is that right is right, wrong is wrong, regardless of what culture says might be right or wrong. But while culture doesn't dictate morality, culture can and really does dictate custom. Uh, and the simple fact is that there are some customs that evolve over time depending on culture, depending on society, depending on the age in which you live. There are some customs that culture has dictated that New Testament Christians have to be very, very careful of so as to not send the wrong message to those that are around us. Now along those lines, just as much as there are customs today that we have to be careful of, there were customs in the first century, cultural customs, that Christians had to be careful of. And because of that, the Bible writers on occasion dealt with those customs so as to provide universal principles that would guide the decision-making process of all people for all time. Now, with that in mind, let's take our attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 because this is where the question ultimately comes from. In 1 Corinthians chapters 11 and 12, really, Paul spent quite a bit of time talking about how Christians were to conduct themselves in the worship assembly. And in the midst of some other material that he was presenting, 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 5, he offered this advice. He said, But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovereth, uncovered dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Was there inherent sin for a woman to not have her head covered in the worship assembly? Well, for that to be the case, you would have to find the command elsewhere in Scripture where God dictated that it was sinful for a woman uh, to not have her head covered in the worship assembly. Uh, and really, this is the only passage through the New Testament you see a Bible writer discuss it. Uh, and so I think it would be good along those lines to go back and see exactly what customs might have been present in the first century that might have caused Paul to make this statement. Uh, and if you take, take a look back at cultural history around this day and time, and particularly in Corinth, what you'll find is that during this time that Paul wrote uh, that it was a general custom 
that women wore veils in public. And if a woman appeared in public without her head covered with a, with a veil, that is her head being bare, then the general thought was that she was advertising herself as a prostitute. Now, these type of women would have paraded themselves around Corinth with their faces unveiled uh, and uh, would have portrayed a particular lifestyle that obviously uh, is not becoming a Christian. Uh, And you have to think that if you lived in a town like Corinth at any point in history where a, a particular look or a particular fashion statement would portray the idea that you are something that you shouldn't be and that you don't want to be, would it not be advisable for you to not do that, to not wear that particular clothing or not to follow that particular custom? So if a woman left her head uncovered, portraying herself as a prostitute, but at the same time was trying to portray herself as a Christian, Uh, What kind of disservice to Christianity do you think that might have served? Well, it would have served a terrible disservice to Christianity. In other words, it wouldn't have been an inherent sin for a woman to not have her head covered. Uh, In other words, there was nothing inherently wrong with a woman not having her head covered, but it was the simple case that because culture dictated that custom, that it was the custom of the day that a woman without her head covered was typically a prostitute, and a Christian lady doesn't want to portray herself as a prostitute, then Paul advised you need to avoid appearing in public without your head covered. Now, in our day and time, there is no custom, uh, cultural custom along those lines, at least not in our country. I understand that that might not be the case in other countries around the world, but at least in our country, it is not a custom uh, that a lady who does not have her head covered is a shame or is advertising herself as being unwholesome or anything of that nature. Uh, And so because of that, there would be no scriptural mandate for a woman to cover her head. It should be noted, though, that while that might not be a custom that we have to pay a lot of attention to, that there are other cultural distinctions of a similar nature present today that we need to seek to avoid. Not necessarily because they are inherently sinful, but because of what they might might portray or imply to somebody that is around us. Um, In other words, just because something isn't wrong, inherently wrong, uh, it doesn't mean it's always a good idea either. Uh, And that was the issue with the head covering of women in Corinth. It wasn't inherently sinful, uh, but at the same time it made them look like something they didn't want to be. Uh, And so even though it might not have been wrong, it most definitely was not a good idea. So uh, I hope that that answer helps you understand. Appreciate the good question. We've reached the halfway point of our program today. We want to offer to you a free track. Our track today is entitled The Bible's teaching on baptism, contradictory or complementary. If you'd like to have that tract or a correspondence course or both, they're absolutely free of charge. Or to send us your question, just contact us. Write us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You may email us at a Bible answer at earthlink.net. Or you can call our toll-free number, 1-800-436-0463. Again, this number is for uh, those that are requesting materials or to give us your Bible question. If you do get the answer machine, please leave your full address and contact information where we can mail you your request. Now you're looking at our web address, www.abibleanswertv.com. We encourage you to go there as well and look at our archives and other good things on our website. Back to our questions today. Our next question to Brother Scott. Please explain 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3 in view of false teaching currently found on television today. Brother Scott. Well, as we begin to answer this question, let's read the passage that is mentioned in that question. 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3. 
But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Sadly, the overwhelming majority of religion seen on TV today uh, has false teaching in it. Not all of it, but I think it's safe to say the majority definitely has false teaching. Many who claim to be preachers uh, are nothing more than motivational speakers. Uh, they won't preach the whole counsel of God. They may offend someone. Uh, they want money to pour in. And it seems that every lesson is about a love offering, about money, about sending in money and being rewarded. Uh, 1 John 4, 1 warns us, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try, we might say, or test the spirits, whether they are of God. Now, why does John warn this? Well, the rest of the verse tells us, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Now, you put these two passages together from 2 Peter 2 uh, and then here in 1 John 4, 1, and we see that there are many false teachers, and sadly, there are many willing to follow them, to believe them. If it's false teaching, though, why is it that so many will listen? Why is it that so many will follow false teachers? Uh, why is it that so many will send in money? Now, sometimes large amounts of money uh, to these on TV who are teaching. Well, there could probably be a long list of reasons, but I think two of the main reasons are many fail to study the Bible for themselves. And so they don't know the difference between truth or error. And the second reason builds on that. Whatever happens to sound good to them, they don't really care. If it sounds good, hey, I'm for that. Now, if it makes me feel good, I don't have to change. Nothing's expected of me. And so if it sounds good, I'll follow that. There have been several studies and even official investigations that have shown many televangelists, for instance, living in large mansions, I mean multi-million dollar mansions, several very expensive cars, and taking long, lavish uh, vacations, two, three, four times a year, while the people that are supporting them are living paycheck to paycheck, uh, sending in money oftentimes from Social Security checks and what little bit of retirement they may have while these are living very worldly lives. Uh, it kind of reminds me of Luke 16, 19, the rich man uh, who fared sumptuously every day. As 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3 shows, uh, they'll use insincere words. Uh, they are smooth talkers. They will say whatever it takes to get more money. Uh, 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4 talks about some of these. Having their ears tickled, they want to hear stories. Uh, they do not want to hear sound doctrine. Again, I want it to sound good. I want to feel good, regardless of how I'm living. And there are those who are willing to tickle ears and want money. Romans 16, 18, For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches, notice what it says, deceive the hearts of the simple. Paul warned Titus about this. He said there were some teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Titus 1, verse 11. And Jude said in verse 6, Their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Or we might word it, because of personal gain. Uh, they'll say whatever it takes for their own personal benefit. When you see someone on TV who is constantly talking about money, every Bible lesson they have is about money and you sending in money, and you being rewarded if you send them money, Compare what they are teaching to the Word of God. And not only that particular show, but do they ever present the whole counsel of God? Or is it just that subject over and over and over? You'll notice, for instance, on this program, a Bible answer. There's no plea for you to send in money. We're not trying to tell you, you send money to us and you'll have a bigger check in the mail by Thursday, uh, as a lot of people teach. This program, on the other hand, offers free of charge, as you just heard mentioned a moment ago. Free of charge, tracks that will help you in your study of the Bible. Correspondence courses to help teach you what the Lord would have you to do uh, to be saved. There's always an invitation to attend a Church of Christ in your area. Uh, and there as well, there's no obligation to give any money uh, on that occasion. 
I want to finish with a quote that I ran across in my studies from Albert Barnes. And he made this statement years ago. The religious principle is the strongest that is implanted in the human bosom. And men who can obtain a livelihood in no other way, or who are too unprincipled or too indolent to labor for an honest living, often turn public teachers of religion and adopt the kind of doctrines that will be likely to give them the greatest power over the purses of others. True religion, indeed, requires of its friends to devote all that they have to the service of God and to the promotion of His cause. But it is very easy to pervert this requirement so that the teacher of error shall take advantage of it for his own aggrandizement. I think that pretty well sums up what we've tried to say in answering this question. And I hope this does help answer your question. Thank you, Brother Scott, for that very good answer. Now to Brother Rhodes. Brother Rhodes, what is the gospel, and what does it mean to obey the gospel? Brother Rhodes. I'm very glad to get this question because the word gospel means good news, and we all love good news. But what is the good news spoken of in Mark chapter 16 and verse 15? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, it's the good news about Jesus Christ. It's the wonderful news that God lived among men, and it's what God did through Jesus Christ and what Christ did for us upon the cross. 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 9 and 10, It was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. The gospel is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Well, the gospel is the words of Christ Jesus. It's the good news about the kingdom of God. God through Jesus Christ has chosen mankind, those who will make the choice to be faithful children of God by accepting the call of the gospel to be a special people. Paul writes to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 12. He says, you were without Christ. He calls them aliens. Strangers from the covenants of promise, having hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes were far off, were made nigh by the blood of Christ. You see, it's through the gospel that we can be brought into the kingdom of God. It's the good news of God's grace. It's what we hope in. It's the good news of God's teaching. It's the Word of God. It was revealed to bring about our obedience, Romans chapter 16, verses 25 through 27. The good news of the gospel convicts us of the sin in our life as we look into the perfect law of liberty. Our sin is revealed to us, and in the gospel we find our reaction to God and what we must do in order to be saved. The good news, the gospel, then, is the entire Bible. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached into you, the Apostle Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. So the gospel, to answer the first part of the question, is the good news of Jesus Christ. But what does it mean to obey the gospel? Well, it means first and foremost that we must follow God's plan of salvation, not some plan of salvation drummed up or dreamt up by mankind. We cannot follow a man-made doctrine and be pleasing to God. It's clear from the scriptures that the gospel message is the message of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. We can read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in the first four verses. Paul makes it clear in these verses that it's essential to believe the gospel, to repent, to confess, and be baptized. Uh, True repentance includes one's response to be obedient to the gospel since it is part of God's essential plan of salvation. But what does it mean to obey Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection? God has never asked us to be literally nailed to the cross, yet he has asked us to establish our faith in the gospel while responding to him and the gospel, or through the gospel, in faithful obedience. Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, Know ye not that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death, Therefore we were buried with him by baptism 
into death, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. It's here we learn how we obey the gospel through Christ's death, his burial, and his resurrection. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12 says that we were buried with him in baptism, wherein also you were risen with him through faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. When one obeys the gospel, when we respond to the gospel call, and we are baptized into Christ, God adds us to the church and our sins are forgiven. If we do not respond to the gospel by being obedient in a faithful manner, then 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8, we can expect the vengeance of God. The Lord has made this response essential for salvation, to respond to Him, to the good news of Jesus Christ. I close with Mark 16, verse 15 and 16. He said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He who believes not shall be condemned. We must answer the call of the gospel to be obedient and acceptable to the Lord God. Thank you for that great question. Thank you very much for that good answer. Paul in Romans chapter 6 verses 17 and 18 said, But God be thanked that ye were, past tense, ye were the servants of sin, but ye obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. They obeyed that form of doctrine which was delivered them. They obeyed a form of doctrine that delivered them from sin. What doctrine? Well, the only doctrine that can free us from sin is the gospel, Romans 1.16. And so the gospel was preached to them, and they obeyed it, and upon their obedience they were made free from sin, and they became the servants of righteousness. But why does he say they obeyed a form or a representation of something? Because as Brother Rhodes has pointed out in 1 Corinthians 15, the three central facts delivered in the gospel Paul preached was the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. It was by that they were saved. And what form or representation of the gospel is more precise in its representation of it than what Paul had just reminded the Romans that they had obeyed namely baptism. One who obeys the gospel by faith, repentance, confession of Christ completes that final condition of baptism that's a representation of the facts of the gospel. Thanks so much for watching today and remember for your Bible questions there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for a Bible answer or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.